Real life. Superpowers. Non-negotiables are incredibly important. When I first had my agency, I had none. I was so proud. You would call me or text me in an hour. I would get back to you and we would get on the phone right away. That's all awful. So we, when we set up, we changed things back then and what we do things now, you cannot get an appointment with me within 48 hours of requesting it, without a doubt. That has to be your first place. Super simple place to start because if, you're, if your time is valuable, it shouldn't be accessible. It shouldn't be unlimited. Hey everyone, today we speak with Kim Walsh Phillips, founder of Parfro Professionals. I feel it's one of those interviews that hits you in the gut. I think that many entrepreneurs and business owners are sort of workaholics by default. And this self-made woman who was once her own slave and experienced pitfalls now sets her own rules and it works. It works so much that she is running a multiple seven-figure business coaching and education company. She is the backstage secret of some of the biggest names in business, including Kevin O'Leary from Shark Tank, Dan Kennedy, Harley Davidson, Hilton Hotels, and High Point University. She shared the stage with some of the world's leading thought leaders, including Tony Robbins, Barbara Corcoran, and Gary Vaynerchuk. She was named number 475 in the Inc. 5000. She's the best-selling author of several business books, one of which was named a must-read by those in business by Forbes magazine. She's doing it all and yet making significant time for her loved ones. She's all heart and she came ready to add value, which I'm sure anyone listening will gain. Enjoy your listen. Real Life Superpowers Superpowers. So Kim, welcome to Real Life Superpowers. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to this conversation. We are too. We are too. What are you up to these days? I am. We're finishing up the school year. Tomorrow's the last day of my kids' school year. So it's a busy time. And it's one of the times that I'm most grateful for the life I've created because I can be fully present with them for all those moments while still running a successful company. And has that always been the case? It was not. I grew up in a home where my mom stayed at home, my dad worked, and for order for him to have more cash for our family, he needed to work more hours. So I grew up believing that the way to be successful is to work a lot. So for my first company, that's what I did. I worked all the time, and yet I was completely broke. And I got to tell you, there are more fun ways to be completely broke than working all of the time. <laughs> um, and it was in, not until I had to hawk my engagement ring in order to make payroll, um, because that's all I had left, that I knew I needed to do something different. And I started looking for a way to grow that would allow me to take my physical labor out of the equation in order to grow our company. Because I was like going to all these networking events, trying to meet a client, to shake a hand, to bring them on. And it was physically exhausting. And I, I needed to find a way to do things differently. It's like happiness is instead of pleasure, right? So I'm, I'm like, there should be, a, what's the science? I need this. This is for me. That is my mission in life is to take, that's what we do. That's what I do every day because I went through that journey and it actually, it came to a head because first I discovered how to do better marketing. I need, I didn't know how to do direct response when that hawk the ring moment happened. I sought, I found one of my business owner friends and I said, your business is going great. You have time with your kids. What are you doing? So I just asked someone who has done it and he gave me a book. It was Dan Kennedy's No BS Direct Response Marketing book. And I was blown away. There, there though, in the book, he's, he hated digital marketing, which is what I did, but I applied all the strategies to it. It worked. He ended up, I ended up meeting him. He became a client. I co-authored a book with him. I got Kevin O'Leary, who in the U.S. is very popular. He's on Shark Tank. He has all of his Shark Tank companies became clients. I did work for television. That would have been like the success that I thought that I wanted, except that I worked 
constantly now because I had high end clients paying me a ton of money. I didn't have to hawk an engagement ring. I could fly in first class everywhere, but I was always working and I was never present for my kids. And so as I was putting them to sleep one night, I just like kind of called out to God, can you freeze time? Because I felt myself missing them growing up. And I heard back, Kim, I don't need to freeze time. You just need to be more present. And I was like, Oh, crap. So I started on a mission of what would I need to do in order to be successful and not work a lot. And I started taking apart the things that I was doing that didn't need to be done that way. One of those things was I could stop doing all my sales calls. How could I sell to clients and not be live selling? So I created a webinar that would sell clients into working with my company. And at the end of the webinar, I had two options. One, you could buy a course. Two, you could become a client. I sold a $5,000 intro 30-day package. Some of them took the course that paid for all of our marketing. Some of them took became clients, which grew my company. Still, we're getting a lot of clients in the door. And so what I knew I needed to do was sell that company and do something that wouldn't require my time. And I finally made that. I wanted to do it for a long time. I finally got the chutzpah to do it. At the time, we had 32 clients in my company that I was so scared to let go of. When I finally decided to sell, in one week I got three offers. I sold my agency within 90 days. I took the money that I got from it to start my coaching business. And in one year, I went from the 32 clients I had in my agency to 11,000 clients. I got rid of my nanny. I got my kids off the bus every single day, which is like that important tells me everything brain dump time. And I grew a company to over $3 million in revenue in one year, working less hours because I structured it differently. So if you want to talk about that structure, I'd love to, um, because this is my mission in life to tell people, you, people say we have to choose between an empire business or a lifestyle business, which are you going to have? An empire business? You don't have to choose. You can literally have a high profile, high revenue, high impact business and still have a life. You just can't do it the way that everybody else seems to be doing it. There is so much to unpack here. And I first want to congratulate you because I think you're fulfilling a lot of people's dream. Uh, and that balance that you're talking about, like that holy grail, wow, that is something that, you know, I, I wish we could help people achieve as much as we can throughout this short conversation. But I have to ask you before, because I'm so curious, you mentioned that your mom was a stay-at-home mom. And I'm wondering yeah. how much that influenced you in the sense that I'm not trying to belittle that. I'm just trying to understand you have such grit. Uh, and how does that play out with a mother? You had this very specific model. So how did you become such an entrepreneur under that? I always felt like a weirdo, which I find a lot of people in my world do. I never felt like I really fit or belonged with them. I loved them and I have a very close relationship with them. And they actually live with me now um, to actually help with my dreams. And in, in the afternoons when my mother is, is baking with my daughter and they bond over that, they like to bake together, they like to sew together. These are not things that are my passions, but I love and appreciate that my mom has those gifts and that my daughter loves them. Like I get to, I love her and appreciate her for who she is. And I love that we, she compliments how I am in differences. That's a lot of work that I've done with this. I can't even remember how it felt back then. Yeah. I just always knew, as so many entrepreneurs do, I always knew I was put on this earth with a purpose and that I was sent here to fulfill it. And I was never going to be satisfied ignoring that for desire for fulfillment. Now, it's really cool because my mom and my dad, they actually now, like we work, we talk about this stuff a lot. My family, in fact, at dinner every night, everyone has to answer the question, who do, whose life did you impact today? Like we talk about this all the time. My parents literally moved from New York to Georgia just so that they could be part of my purpose because they see it and they want to support it. That was not like back in the day, that was not, you know, none of us knew any better. I just always knew that in fact, regardless of the fact that she was scared of every decision I made, that they told me that it probably wouldn't work. I was so certain in my belief that it would, that I just kept going forward. And it didn't somehow shake you when, it, when you felt their fear didn't impact you like negatively? 
I think it would make me question things occasionally, but I also knew very clearly that I didn't want the life that she had. I appreciated her. I didn't want her to change. I didn't want the life that she had. So if I didn't want the life that she had, I couldn't make decisions based on how she would make them. Like that always made sense to me. And from a very early age, I knew I should only ever take advice from someone I was willing to trade places with. Like, I'm not taking advice from you if you haven't accomplished the thing in your life that I'm trying to get. I've always thought that. And I don't know where that belief came from. I'm sure someone gave it to me, but it's really valuable, well-given belief because I wasn't ever seeking advice. Now, I can't say I didn't let others influence me in some way. And it took me a while to figure that out. I definitely was way too worried about what people would think about me from a, for a long time. That was probably my greatest weakness that I needed to overcome. But I, I never, I, I always knew my parents weren't going to be the ones to help me achieve my career goals because they had not done it yet. So how did you find out your purpose? It couldn't have been that clear from the get-go. No, it wasn't. Um, it wasn't that clear from the get-go. But I had this really dark moment where I had had my first daughter. And I um, I had my first daughter. And she. I had never taken time off from work at that point. I was still in the desperation of working constantly. And I was still in the desperation of not having a lot of money. I would love to say the day after the, my ring, pop, you know, pawning my ring, everything changed. It didn't. Um, and so I was in this dark moment of she's, she was, she cried a lot. She was finally sleeping. I go through my mail and I got a letter from my bank telling me that they weren't going to cover my overdraft protection anymore, which is what I was relying on to cover my bills while I was out on maternity leave. And, um, I was just desperate because I couldn't go out and hustle, which is what I'd always done. And it felt like one of the darkest moments of my life that I was going to actually have to go to my husband. We both had come from very bad first marriages of people who had done financial bad things to us. And I was going to have to tell him I needed us to pull money out of our retirement in order to make payroll. And it was a conversation I did not want to have. It was a moment it felt like I'm a failure. I'm now not just failing for me. I'm failing for my kid. Like, this is awful. And it felt really dark, but this is so weird. I am a woman of deep faith. And I will tell you, in that darkness, I can still feel it in my body. Like, my face getting hot. My shoulders are getting tight. I could feel that moment. I can see a light that was streaming in through the window. And I, like, still get, and it was saying to me clearly, remember this moment this is what you're going to prevent for others. You're going to, that you're going to go through something that's going to become the light you're going to shine. So like legit, that sounds totally wackadoodle pants. I get that. But in that moment, I knew I was about to figure out something that was going to change my life forever. And I wasn't for me. It was never for me. It was always so that I could take other people through that journey. It, but it sounds like, you know, the epiphany came from like self-reliance. The way that you didn't take advice and you went for it, there's something self-reliant about that journey. Yeah, I definitely took advice though. I just took advice from people who had achieved the thing. Like whenever I'm, I would, whenever I got the opportunity to be in an environment or in the midst of someone who has achieved something I want, I will ask a ton of questions for that person. I will not talk. I will not try to self-impress. I will ask and ask and ask and learn and discover and ask. So I am that person who is not scared to ask the questions, but I will only ask them of somebody who I want to achieve the thing that they have done. I won't ask that advice of someone just to get their opinion on something. Like my husband now, I do not ask him for fashion advice because he's an awesome guy. He is not a great dresser. He will never be the one that I will take with me to style me for an event. Like he, that's not him. And that's okay. I love him. He's amazing. I think he's super hot, but I don't, he's not going to style me for an, an event because he doesn't have that kind of style or taste. Right. So you're able to, to not crown anybody for everything and be able to take your advice from the relevant context yeah. and person. And yeah. So maybe let's talk a little bit about what you found out, like through that epiphany, what came next and then how did you pave your way through there? Yeah. What's amazing in our next business, I learned so many things. And I think like I was married, but like I shared, I was married before and I went on this journey, which I think a lot of my self-discovery came from 
that process to my next company, which is awesome. And that I went to through a lot of therapy before I like, if I'm going to get married again, I want to be the person I want to be to attract the, the husband that I want. And I got to figure out why did I make the choices that I made in my first marriage that weren't weren't um, serving me well. And so in diving in through all of that, I learned a lot of things about myself. And one of those things was, I am a giver and I love being a giver, but because I'm a giver, I'm not, I don't want to change that about myself, but I've got to be in an environment of other givers because that's when that feels good being a giver. It was like this idea of the game of ping pong. If I hit the ball once, it's got, I can hit it only twice before it gets served back to me. If it doesn't get served back to me, I can't be in a relationship with that person, a friend, a partner, a client. So then it came to what people did I love working with the most when we had our agency? And they were people who wanted to make an incredible impact on the world and would follow the advice that I gave them. Those are the people I loved working with, right? So then I started thinking, who were those people? Wouldn't it be amazing if I could have a company where I just coached those types of people? I said, why couldn't I do that? So we narrowed our focus about who we coach to get super uber specific. And when I figured out, Wait, looking at who my client, yeah. Oh, um, I took with me from my other company, my COO, um, Kelly LeMay. She's been with me for 21 years now. So she didn't go with the guy who bought my firm. She came with me to the new company. And she ran the agency for me. She was the director of client relationships. And then she came with me to the new company and I made her our chief operating officer. And um, so we looked at who we had, who were our best the clients we loved working with the most. They were very profitable and very successful with the work we did for them. And what we found was these were people who already owned a business had generated around a half a million to a million dollars in revenue, sometimes a little less, sometimes a little more, but they didn't know how to successfully grow their business other than word of mouth and referrals. Like they were willing to do the work. They just didn't know how to do effective digital automated marketing. This is the other random facts, okay? They also were into some kind of sport. Tough Mudder, cycling, running, marathons. They were on a sports team, which makes a lot of sense because if you're someone who does those things, you're someone who's willing to take action. You're an ambitious human. You're unusual in your marketplace, right? Or they're a frequent flyer. They're at a high level status with airlines. Like that was my person. So we actually made it so that all of our marketing focused on reaching that person. So from the beginning, I'm like, you got to be a nice person. If you're mean to me or my team, you don't get to work with us. You also have to be someone who already owns a business. We're not helping you start one. You already own a business. You have to be successful. You just don't know how to scale. And I was willing to go like, whoop, this is who I want to work with and simplify. We got rid of all the stuff we'd been doing. I'd been talking about, I'm so proud. If I wanted cash, I could launch a new course. It could bring in revenue. Look at me go. That's awful. Because when you launch new things all the time, it's exhausting. You have to create a whole new big theater blowout show. And then you're setting up a new show every month. So we said, forget it. We have one course, one webinar, one group coaching program, one mastermind, one elite level. That's it. That's my entire business. That's my entire business. We have over 300 people in our coaching program. The least expensive coaching program that I have is $1,500 a month. And I can completely control my time because I know exactly what I'm doing each and every week. I got to ask you though, like it makes sense to me, but at the same time, I'm wondering, it sort of sounds privileged to be able to say, I'm only working with, and I get the logic that once you do that, it's sort of the stars align and people will actually come to you because, you know, there's this scarcity and you're sort of a closed club. But at the same time, how do you take that leap of faith that people, that you won't stay, you know, without any clients once you, uh, once you allow yourself, you know? That well, I got to ask you, why does that sound privileged to you? Um, because you're sort of saying, I deserve to only work with certain people and maybe you won't get enough of those and then you won't be able to actually uh, provide what you need. So I'm going to, I'm going to so compete, compete with that. It's, it's, yeah. it's just saying, it's saying that's where I can do a good job. 
Like it's focusing exactly. on where they, when they're saying what clients do you want to work with, think about it differently, what yes. clients would we have impact on? But, but there is a question here, not on the privilege side, is a question on, on what happens if those clients, you know, you become irrelevant suddenly. Okay. Or like, this is for like people who are going a thing or the competition is fierce or you can't get that break even it costs more to productions you know any pivot that's that's making which i'm sure you did as well so make, you probably found out that there's five different segments and it wasn't the like first thing uh you know like the evolution where do you stop because that's like optimizing all the time right yeah so this is what is so interesting the more narrow you get the easier it is to scale and bring in a massive number of people which goes against our thought process. We think we have to keep it wider in order to attract a bunch of people, but actually when you get really narrow, the people that you are speaking to hear you like a dog whistle through the crowd, where when you stay broad, nobody hears you because they think you sound like everybody else. So I would say the only way to have success in this model is to get as specific as make all of your messaging as though you're talking to one person. My guy is called Alex. Everything I create is created for Alex. Every single one of my coaching clients has what they call their apex alley or Alex that they focus their messaging on. And every time those clients come in, they say, I feel like you were reading my mind. This is the exact thing I was waiting to listen to hear. The only people who hear that out of my mouth are the people that I actually want to coach. So it's like I get to create an environment. Every single person who joins my list has heard that message and that's why they came in. So they're my exact right fit client. Incredible. And I'm guessing it's a little meta because I'm sure that's one of the first pieces of advice that you also give Alex to find their Alex, right? Yeah, but it can, you can go any of the ways. So for example, one of my coaching clients is a weight loss coach and she will say something like, if you've ever, she'll say in the very beginning, if you've ever, if you are someone who's tried keto, fasting, low carb and Weight Watchers, then this is the advice you need to listen to. So that is even, she's not a coach that talks about marketing, but yet in an interview, she'll call out her person. Her person is someone who's tried a bunch of restrictive diets before that haven't worked well. And she's going to help them with their mindset because that's what they're actually going to need in order to lose weight. So you can do the call out your person in the very beginning, no matter who your person is. Right, right. So, and, and I'm sure that that's what you tell them, you know, your Alex's. And I'm wondering what else, like what other tips um, could you give uh, business owners who are trying to scale? You want to think about the journey of your prospect to client, like a dating relationship, right? And because I think we think like back when I was single, I would go out with typically one of three guys. He was really, really pretty and loved talking about himself. And the only time he talked about to ask me a question was, why did you go out with me? Which is really another question all about him. Or there would be the never makes a move guy. There's some kind of spark, but he never leans in for the kiss. Or there would be the way too serious, way too soon because his mama has put pressure on him to get married. And he's talking to me about how many kids do I want to have on the first date? And I'm like, what? We haven't even gotten to dessert yet, my friend. But that's what we do usually with our marketing. We're either making it all about us and our process and what we could do to fix the person we're talking to, or we make it about, we never make a move, we never ask for the sale, or we make ask for the sale right away. And when it comes to successfully growing your business, you think about it as a customer courtship, you first have to attract them to you with one idea one, only one, one will be boring to you, but it will be incredibly fascinating and magnetic to your prospect that you attract them to you. So what's the one wish that your Apex Alley or Alex has? All of your marketing should be about that one wish. Then give them a free gift so that you can get their contact information and then you make them the sale. So I call this the mom method, because mom, she knows best. The M, magnetic, attracting your perfect prospect to you. O, you get her to opt in. And then M, you're mag you monetize it, offering them an opportunity to work with you either buy your product, enroll in your program, become a client of your service, whatever one of those uh, strategies works. 
And what's your magnet? So we have a free course called, um, and that's also a tip, call your free gift a free course. You could record a video for 15 or 20 minutes. It has a higher perceived value of um, that gift item. And I have a free co course called the Audience Builder Blueprint. And we empower entrepreneurs to grow their following, get more leads and produce clients because my market, the number one problem they want to solve is that they wanna get more leads and sales. So my free gift solves that problem. And then how were you able to get those tier one clients? So we use a combination of things. I am, I use free and organic, I'm free and paid, free. I'll do things like this amazing interview we have right now. I'll do podcast interviews. I love them. Podcast listeners are more likely to be a customer, client, or patient than anybody else because you guys that listen to this right now are in the top 1% of all humans because you're willing to take action. You already are an ambition, ambitious person because you're listening to a podcast. The, I write books, so I'm a published author, so people read my books. Books are actually one tier above podcasts because people who are willing to get a book and read it are, again, in your top percentage of the of that space. I'm also on Clubhouse, and that is, again, people who seek and take action are using that platform. And then we go to a broader market, which is social media. So I have over a million followers online that I've grown, and I have... Uh, weekly lives that I do. I have posts that I have. I have um, uh, polls and stories that we do. And then we use, I do speaking engagements. I speak on a lot of people's stages. It's one of my love languages. So I love doing that. I get a lot of great clients from that. And then we do paid advertising using that free gift um, as our paid lead, as well as we'll do Facebook challenges and webinars and things along the, those lines to bring people in. But we use both free and paid. It's amazing for me, like there's something about that, the focus that you have, like it's like, you know, those old uh, writing machines where you take it back each time and like you, you do that and it's, it's, it, it's really, a, it's, it's an amazing gift. I'm, I'm wondering, like, how did you A-B test to get to the result where you, 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 it's so, like, it's so precise for me, it's brutal sim simplicity and I love it. But what test tests do you do to get to a method where you know that? That's a great question. And I... Uh, my favorite quote is, in God I trust, everyone else brings data. And so I am a data nerd, and I love the power that data gives us. So we will test things like two different subject lines on an email to see what gets the highest open rate, um, a different call to action. I'll change. I did one webinar when I was scaling this model. I did one webinar 119 times. Um, every single week I did a webinar and I would change one thing about it to see how that would change our results. Um, now, today, one of my um, greatest assets is Clubhouse. I have 18,000 followers on that platform and I will name a room um, something different based on a headline we're trying to test and I'll see which headline gets me the greatest response rate which call to action I have in the room has the greatest response rate. And then what it, when those people respond, are they our, our right fit clients? And are they enrolling and purchasing? So we track every source of lead generation separately. So I know if you came from a paid ad on Instagram or a post on Instagram or a story on Instagram, I know where you came from. So then I know what where I should put more energy into bringing clients in the door. So you're like always optimizing. Yeah, always. Well, and that's the beautiful thing about, like you just said, that's why I love the simple business model. Because I'm not constantly launching something new, we can focus all of our energy on optimizing the process in which you come in as a client because I don't have to focus my energy on selling new things. So we go super deep. I can actually tell you which um, partners do the best for us. So I know that type of industry that's the best. So I could go to their conferences, develop more relationships with that other niche that's good for me because I can spend time optimizing that versus having to do a new launch this week. So we've gone really, really deep into the marketing, which serves my market well, because I teach them how to market. And so we only teach strategies that I actually use in my business and that I've optimized it at least 90 days 
So they're not hearing about something that worked for a week, which drives me nuts when people do that. They hear something that's actually working and um, we'll test all those things out to see if they work. And some things don't, like I actually don't post every day on social media and I don't think it's necessary. I have, we tested that. I did not increase my results from organic social by me posting every day. And it was exhausting for me and the team. So we don't do it. And I post two to three times a week. I have the same ROI from social doing that. So I will constantly test trying to find the least amount of time I can spend doing something with the greatest ROI from it. I'm, I'm wondering this, like as like one of the challenges with the, the new entrepreneurs is that the, yeah. the amount of information and opportunities are really mm -hmm. wide, right? But you're focused enough that you know your end game and you have this inspiring story where this epiphany came to you where the end game is that, okay? But mm -hmm. there's people who didn't see the, that, that uh, bad, place or that influence or yeah. that inspiration. And then it's like a dad saying, you have to stretch, you're getting going to stuck after sports, right? And then they don't stretch anyway. So like, what would you say? How would you implement that? Solve a problem right now so that you could create cash for yourself to give you the, the, the grace to be able to do things more strategically. I think it's impossible to be strategic when you're worrying about how you're going to pay for your rent or how you're going to pay your employee or that is like next to impossible. And so what we always say, get a fast path to cash. What would be the fastest path to cash in the business that you have? Would it be to do a, a, do a sprint to have a certain number of sales? Like how much money would you need for three months of running your business and how could you create that? So I literally make that the first goal because what I have found with our clients is we have this thing that they do when they first start with us. It's called the 42 days to cash. We walk them through a process of how to launch a course in 42 days and actually sell it on a webinar that will bring money in the door. Because I know with them, if I could cover the first few months of them working with me, that they don't have to worry about it anymore, we can now start being strategic. So I say, give yourself grace and look for the fastest. And if you're like, what would be the best path to cash? Well, what have people paid you the most for up at this point? And how could you get enough of them in order to accomplish your goal? Like that literally will be step one. Super simple. If in my space of coaching, you could literally create that free course that I just mentioned. You make that page one, page two, you say, if you want to, do you want to get solve this problem faster? That's what we help people do. Book a call with me and we could talk about how we could do it for you. So a super simple client generation funnel, free gift, appointment generation on the thank you page, book a call, get a client. Like that, I, I would say, this is how many clients I need to cover my expenses for three months. This is how many clients I'm going to go after over the next two weeks. Once I have that done, I'm stopping this crazy process because it's never going to scale. And I'm going to use that cash to actually create a model that will allow me to scale my business. Wow. But why is it never going to scale? One-on-one -on -one can't scale. If they're going after clients because that's what will produce enough cash, they're, they would, the only way to 100x their business is 100x their hours. And at a certain point, you can't do that anymore. But you can do that in the beginning, when you know you're doing it for the purpose of generating cash, the problem is the cash feels so good. So you got to make yourself a, like a cutoff point right. where you're not going to do that anymore and like be accountable to someone. So you stop because if not, you're going to get burnt out and really none of this is going to work. You do it just knowing you're doing it to bring enough revenue in to get you to the next step. So like the collateral damage here would be those uh, those short-term clients that they're sort of doubling down on that they will have to then dismiss, right? Oh, I love that you're such a person of heart. No, we would say in that moment, how could we serve them well when we shift our business? Not that we can't, but how could we? So how we could is when we create our eventual group coaching program, we could grandfather them in into whatever work we were doing and even give them some bonus one-on-one -on -one sessions as a gift to them for having been our founding members. There's a lot of ways you can treat those people incredibly well. I still have coaching clients since before I sold my marketing agency. Huh. I still have people I was working with me from then that have been with me for over seven years. They, they actually pay me the same low rate that they paid me then on purpose. They are a gift that I will give back to all the time. So they feel good about the fact that they're getting my top tier coaching program that's $40,000 for a lot less than anybody else because they've been with me since the beginning. 
Got it. This sounds like so scalable and I don't understand how uh, it works with getting the, the, the Dan Kennedy's as your, into your client base, because that's sort of, that, that's an automated process. And I'm assuming those types of clients aren't. Yeah. So I have this elite level because what they really want is me. They want my mine. They want me to be their fractional chief marketing officer. Basically, they want me to be the. They want my strategic mind. And what I have found is, I can run a one day strategy day with them as they start. That we will. I've now gotten to a point where I do it in three 90 minute sessions because I can get the most for them when I do 90 minute sessions. And then I meet with them every other week for 15 minutes and I coach on that. My team does 15 minutes every other week and my team does any execution in between of things that we need to help them with. So I don't touch it after that. And I have a, I have someone who sits on my elite calls with me. She's my, she's an operations manager. She will be taking detailed notes about everything that client and I speak about. And then she puts it all in our coaching program. So they have those notes and know what they need to do next. And I have those, my team has those notes of what they need to do next. And I don't do anything in between those calls. So my time's completely scalable. Uh, every other Friday, so tomorrow will be when we're recording this on a th no, so Wednesday, a few days from now, we'll be doing this on a uh, with my Friday call, and I start at um, nine a.m. in the morning, and I go until twelve thirty every other Friday with my elite clients, and I that one I spend about three hours a month on my elite clients, or no, three and a half three and a half, three and a half, seven hours a month of my elite clients. And that is worth over a million dollars in revenue to me and people that I absolutely love talking to. So I look forward to that day and it's a ton of revenue. And those, that's the only one-on-one -on -one work I do in my entire business. Everything else is group coaching. Okay, I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> what kind of sport do you do? Because the self-discipline thing is, is, is like, yes. what competitions are you, are you into? I'm in a lot of competition. Well, my kids are in softball, so we're very competitive in that. We coach okay. them in softball, but I'm a runner. Okay. Did you do it like semi-professionally or? No, 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 no. Just as a passion. I'm, I'm just a very motivated individual. But my number one motivation is truly to make sure that I could reach more people today than I did yesterday with this exact message so that they can stop feeling like they have to sacrifice everything else in their life to grow their company and that they get to the end of their life and wish that they had done things differently. That is what I'm trying to prevent. So I, I think of myself as the edge of the beach, like digging a hole faster than the ocean comes in. So I can reach as many people as I can every single day. And I feel that kind of desire, pressure, and speed in order to do it because I know I get to see this happen and change in my clients' lives every single day. And I know as soon as they get to see this model, they're like, oh my gosh, we just, I didn't know this. This makes so much sense. I should be doing this. I can do this. I did do this. Now I want to tell others about this. That happens again and again and again and again. And I just want to reach as many people as I can. Yep. And like, what are you able to cover in 15 minutes every two weeks? So the, because we have the plan in place, we're just talking about it. And I am also a certified life coach. And typically, as you would imagine this to be true, most of the times, the reason why they haven't accomplished what they want to accomplish, it's not because they don't know how, or they can't find the people. It's because something up here is preventing them to, from doing it. And so just like when you said we can't, because I could tell your heart and you feel like you owe people something, which I would, if you were my coaching client, like we would dive into that before I would ever give you a marketing strategy. Mm -hmm. I will talk about those things with them. And it's almost more of a therapy session than it is really. Now I do get marketing advice and up, but I'll more, I will tell them where in our portal, we have lots of great marketing strategies and templates and things. I more will tell them, okay, Diana is going to give you the link to this thing. But right now, let's talk about why haven't you done it yet? You knew it was there. You knew that program was there. You knew you could have asked this question, but for now, why haven't you? Like, why are you allowing confusion to stop you from moving forward? And then we'll dive into the why so they can get accountable to it. And then we'll have something they're going to accomplish before the next call, which will allow them to break through of why they haven't accomplished it yet. Because like a therapy session is typically like 45 minutes, an hour. So this is like, you know, on steroids. Yep. Wow. Okay. And how do you handle stuff when things don't work out as you plan? It is always the answer. There is no win or lose in my life. There's always, what did I learn from this? 
So it's always, what did I learn and what can happen? So I'll give you an example. Yesterday, this is a real life example. Yet two days ago, my good friend's mother died. I had client calls planned for the afternoon. I wanted to be able to go get her daughter from the bus and take her into my house and just be there for her while her mom was dealing with something. So how did I deal with that? I just told my coaching clients, I have a great relationship with them. Listen, one of my friends had just lost her mom. I want to be able to be for her daughter. I'm not going to be there. Lori is copied on this. She'll reschedule for you. I have an assistant. So she could jump in right away and take care of them. So that was that night. That was something that we just, you prioritize. Family, my faith, that's more important to me than anything else. That's always going to come first. Next day, my both of my children yesterday morning woke up with a 100 degree fever. What? I was supposed to be on a on a, a live event of one of my coaching clients. So I thought, okay, what are we going to do? I jumped on a camera. I said, not how can't I do this? He had that event. I couldn't cancel on him. I decided how can I take care of him and still take care of my kids? I'm going to record a video with my talk I was going to give on his live event and give him the video. So when I sent him the message to say, my kids are sick. I recorded this video for you. I'm going to go take care of them now. It is, for my mind, it is always, absolutely things are going to happen. But because I have my priorities in order, because I'm deep into my purpose, I would never have made the excuse of, I can't take them to the doctor or I can't support his program. My next thought is, how can I make both things happen right now? And so I'll go into problem-solving mode versus excuse-making mode. And I think if the more we can do that, the more we can find solutions that will bring us to how do we versus how can't we, that's when we are able to reach that level of quickly scaling our company. But also, I guess it's exactly what you're saying of once you have your priorities straight, you sort of can apply rules of thumb. So when something happens, you're able to sort of zoom out and say, wait, where did this fall under? And now what do I have to solve? Right. Yeah. I always know what's going to come first, but then I also won't use my priorities as an excuse of why I don't get my other priorities done. I think too many people who are parents will blame their children for the reason why they didn't accomplish their dreams and goals. And I think that is the worst thing you could possibly do. They are never your excuse. They are always a choice. But instead of saying, because I do this, I can't do that. Instead, my response would be, if I want to do this, how can I also do that? Like looking for the how versus the can't. Because I think a lot of people listening would feel like you can't have it all. And you're sort of waving this flag saying, people, you can have it all. It's just a matter of how, right? It is. Like this is what's intriguing for you. That this is a, a common problem because most people um, have children and most people have to like that are entrepreneurs, have to manage that. And the thing is, I'm, I'm sure that most of them, at least I want to think that most people are, are, have their priorities straight and they understand that value. Some people probably will lie to themselves and they don't mean that family will say that, but the, for the people that don't, how, what, how do you do the boundaries? Like you say to the kid, um, I have to go to work, but you know, that, that meeting may or may not be important. You know, wh where's the boundary? I'm going to tell you my boundaries and how you set them, but also I will never, my children never heard me say I have to go to work. And that was a piece of advice that someone taught me early on when she found out I was pregnant with my first daughter. She was the um, Surgeon General, first Surgeon General in Pennsylvania. And she told me, my mom taught me never to say I have to go to work. You will always say I get to go to work. So I will always say I get to go impact lives today. And I want you to go impact lives today. And that's why we have that conversation at dinner who did you impact? Because mommy gets to go make an impact today. And I want you to go make your impact today. So I let them know from the very beginning, I am both an entrepreneur and their mother. I am not either or one more than I am both things. And I want them to be my daughter and also an athlete and also a student. So we talk about who we are in that way. But Non-negotiables are incredibly important. When I first had my agency, I had none. I was so proud. You would call me or text me in an hour. I would get back to you and we would get on the phone right away. That's all awful. So we, when we set up, we changed things back then and when we do things now, you cannot get an appointment with me within 48 hours of requesting it, without a doubt. 
That has to be your first place. Super simple place to start because if, you're, if your time is valuable, it shouldn't be accessible. It shouldn't be uh, like unlimited. You should never send out a Calendly link that has 57 different open slots on it. Again, you're saying, I'm totally available. I'm totally accessible. No, 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 no more than three. I would prefer you to have your assistant set up calls and not even give the, them that link. If you're a jerk to me or my team, I will not work with you. That's just the rule. If you're a jerk during the prospecting process, you cannot come. We will not take you on as a client. We only work with nice people. It, I do not work evenings. I do not work weekends. If you want to send me a message during those times, that's totally fine. But you know, you're not going to hear back from me until the next day. My clients know that whenever they leave me a message on the evenings or weekends, they always say, I know you're not going to respond back to this until they'll fill in the blank. Because I tell them, this is what I do. This is what I want you to do. I have off every school holiday. My team gets off every Friday all summer. We take off the entire, we take off two weeks at the holidays. They are all off, all of my clients know. They know that from the second they start working with me. So you tell them and then you have to follow it. So if you don't want them expecting you to get back to them on the evenings and weekends, you cannot get back to them on the evenings and weekends. And if you feel like you really want to, write it then, but schedule that email to not get to them until 8 a.m. Monday morning create those boundaries for yourself. And if you're so scared, they're going to leave. If you don't get back to them right away, then you have the wrong client, yeah. right? We've got to change that. One other thing, I never, ever negotiate on price, never negotiate on price. Because if you do, you're telling your client right away, I lie to you. There's always a better deal you could get from me. Just make sure you ask for it. But I will, I will negotiate on payment terms. So maybe... You want to become an elite client, it's 40000 but you're like, I can't do 40000 all up front. And I will say, what could you do as a monthly rate that would get this to work for you? And so I will work on payment terms versus pricing, but I do not negotiate on price. Now, back to, I'm going to tell you this because you're going to want to know it because you got a big heart. How do I work with the people that can't afford me? Because that was a little thought in your brain. How am I going to serve all those people who are like outside waiting to work with me and I won't take them because I, I charge so much. We have a scholarship program and you can too. We have a program that people that can't afford our program can apply to. And we pick two people per class to win that scholarship. And so we do have people in our program who did not pay me their full rate, but I still have them pay something because they have to pay something in order to do the work. And so they get to pick what their price is. I have the person we just gave a scholarship to, she runs an incredible nonprofit all about how to prevent suicide in kids. She said she could pay $100 a month. That's what she's paying. Well, everyone else is paying $1,500 a month because we have a scholarship that allowed me to bring her in, but I still have her paying something because what I have found is when people pay nothing, they don't do the work. So um, you can pull that piece in too, but that's our non-negotiables. Everyone in my program um, did, is paying the full price. That clarity is so inspiring. And you, you spoke about how you were sort of your own slave. So that shift that you created and, the, and how those non-negotiables, it's so wonderful to see. And also, you know, from like a women power perspective, like seeing a mother who's able to do, to have it all, like it seems almost unreal, but then listening to you break it down, it does make sense because it's like Renan was saying, it's about those boundaries because even with those elite clients, you find those 15 minute segments instead of, you know, you could have through those elite clients, you could have maybe also become a slave again just uh, on call. And it seems like you've become the master of the domain here and like, like setting the rules. Absolutely. Right. When we come into an understanding that we are actually responsible for everything that is in our life, everything, then we also, it's a, it can feel daunting. It can feel heavy, but it can also feel exciting and empowering because then we get to create the company and life that we want. When we get to, so there are people who would never want to be in my coaching because they would want somebody who would be on call 24 seven. And that's totally cool. That's just not my right fit. 
And so you have to be willing to enter in with a thought of abundance, that if I want my life to look like this, if I want my company to look like this, then I have to be willing to um, operate on the understanding and belief that there's enough people around there that will, that will follow that path. And this is what's so cool. When we think about, when we think about um, like Richard Branson, we would think his time is very valuable. You can't just call him up and get an appointment with him, right? But we don't think that same way about ourselves. So if you start thinking about some of the people you think about that are really valuable, how do they operate? How could you take one of the strategies they have in place and apply it to yourself? And what's amazing about that is not only will it attract more people to you, but the more um, more exclusive you become, the more desirable you become, and the more people will want to pay you. And I don't know why the psychology of that is what it is. And I'm sure there's some deep, dark problem we need to fix about the world to make that the case, but that is what the world is like. And so if we want to be able to serve the world, we have to be willing to get paid what we're worth. Right. So what's next for you? I am, I just got a book deal to put this entire concept into a book. It's called The Anti-Hustle and Grind, how to um, how to have a lifestyle and an empire business at the same time. And my goal is to take that message to as many entrepreneurs as humanly possible till I take my last breath so that they can uncover a way to impact many, generate massive income, and still have the life that they love. Okay, I think it's safe to say, to, to bet that you're actually going to achieve your goal. So good luck with it. I'm so grateful to people like you that give me the opportunity to tell the story because that's helping me fulfill my mission. So thank you so much. What's your superpower? Uncovering what other people's superpowers are so that they can bring them to the world. That is great. I, I would definitely say, by the way, you're the master of sniper. As for me, like this, this is like, like I, I have an answer of the dark things that, that you're looking for. The dark thing is, that people usually don't know what they want. So they want something that someone else has. And that's why you're inspiring because the, the, the quickness that, that you get to, you know, that's not a question for me. This is an answer. That's not a question for me. And it's so focused that that already feels like, oh yeah, okay. I, I have to go after that. She's more, you know, she knows exactly what we want. And it's not, and it's very precise. So like, that's really inspiring. Like. You know, for my girl power, you guys think you go girl. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And I mean, here's the thing, right? The people that when we get to get that top of that mountain and we get to see how beautiful it is, I believe our goal is to not only tell them down below, it's really beautiful. You should come up the hill. It's so beautiful. You should come up the hill. And it's not even that we're supposed to take their hand and help pull them up the hill, but it's my job to tell them you can do this. And I believe enough in you to do this. And I'm willing to pull you up because I know you can do this. I'm willing to put my life at risk to pull you up because I know eventually you're going to be on firm enough footing that you're going to be able to pull me up the rest of the mountain. So I, I believe our job is not only to uncover the thing, not to show people the way, but to believe enough in them so that they can start to believe in themselves. Wow, it's so beautiful. I feel so lame to ask like such a downer of what's your kryptonite? Wanting to um, serve many and the pain I feel at the end of the day that I didn't reach as many as I could. That would be my sadness. So I don't know if you guys saw Schindler's List. This is like such a morbid thought, but this is literally the image that I have at the end when he sees the pin on his lapel, like I get so upset about this, but when he sees the pin on his lapel and he realized he could have sold it, so he could have saved three more lives. I literally think about that all the time. Like what, what could, could I have made a choice differently? So I could have saved more people. And I will just open myself up to that. So to not operate in selfishness, instead operate in a place of how can I serve the world more? And so I would say that would be what it is, you know, making those decisions. Thank you for the beautiful work you do and how you guys are changing the world every single day. Thank you so much.
Yeah, and I'm, I'm kind of speechless. Great person to be on Peru. There's no, there's no better about it. Just the, being, being human, and humane, and uh, succeeding. Like that's 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 a different superpower. That's the village of superheroes. So keep on doing it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Real life superpowers. Technology. It's alive! Real. Live. Superpowers.